Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Before we introduce this week's guest, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a great way to support everything Cool Tools does, including our newsletters, podcast, video channel, and our flagship review website. This week, we want to give a shout out to Edward Grabe. To become a patron of Cool Tools, visit patreon.com slash cool tools. Our guest this week is Neil Day. Neil's been writing software for over 40 years and loves coffee, making things, and outdoor adventures. He's led technology teams at walmart.com, Shutterfly, Blue Bottle Coffee, and Dr. Consulta, as well as having started a number of companies. It's great to have you, Neil. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on the show. Well, it's our pleasure. We're so delighted that you can join us. We really are, uh, Neil. And uh, uh, I, I guess we have a mutual friend in, in Ari Gentry and Arian Palo, who have both been guests on the show previously. Absolutely. Uh, Arian and I worked together at Blue Bottle and uh, had a great time there, developed a friendship. And it's, it's been great knowing him and Ari over the years. That's so cool. So uh, let's jump into the tools. The first one is the Millwright hand grinder. Tell us about that. Um, I was at first thinking that this was like an angle grinder, but uh, I'm way off base here. No. So this is a, a coffee grinder, actually. So so one of my passions is good coffee. And, uh, and it's a great area if you're into tools and noodling around with uh, new devices and technology. And uh, one of the things uh, I, I really enjoy doing is being able to take my, my coffee gear with me on the road. And so having a really nice portable hand grinder is a really important part of that. And one of the things people don't know about making great coffee is that grind is actually the second most important thing. Getting good beans is the most important, but being able to grind them well and consistently is really what leads to a fantastic cup. So I've played with tens of grinders and a bunch of hand grinders. And when I saw uh, the St. Anthony's industry um, uh, hand grinder come out, was really intrigued and ordered uh, one of their early units. And the thing that's amazing about it is it's so smooth. They did an incredible job with um, all the mechanical aspects and they put amazing bearings into it. So it removes almost all of the friction and it's it, it creates such a nice, smooth motion um, and sort of a really tactile experience while you're grinding the beans. Um, and how, how, how large is it and how portable is it? And can you describe what it looks like for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a beautiful CNC um, aluminum tube that's uh, the size of kind of you know, a medium sized, um, like pepper grinder essentially. So it's, it's about two, two and a half inches in diameter and, um, about, uh, five inches tall. It's like, and, like a toilet paper roll. Yeah. It's a little bigger than a toilet paper roll basically. And, um, it has a detachable handle that has uh, a really nice wood knob on it. That's really comfortable to put in your hand. And, um, uh, you just insert the handle into um, a little hex receiver, and uh, it engages with the mechanism and, and turns really nicely. So, uh, so the handle departs from the cylinder when you pack it to it, to exactly, it. and and it comes with a really clever leather sheath that you can insert the handle into and then um, sort of bundle the whole thing up and protect the beautifully anodized aluminum and keep the handle um, nicely kind of bundled with it as well. And so it, it folds up into a really nice compact travel um, kind of case. And this is going to grind enough coffee for a single cup? Yeah, so it's, it's oriented towards doing a single pour over. Um, I've actually been using it for espresso and... Um, 
you can easily get uh, 21 grams of beans, um, actually about up to 25 grams of beans into the into the grind chamber. So that's a, the perfect amount for uh, a, a big espresso or a pour over. Um, and it only takes about two minutes to grind everything. So, And it's $150. Yes. And that's actually one of the things I, I was amazed at. Lots, there are lots of really good grinders on the market, but to get one that's really going to do a good job, um, you know, in a, in a motorized grinder, you really have to spend at least $400 or so to get a good burr set. This has an amazing burr set. And because it's a simpler device, you can get the, uh, the quality of a, literally a $2,000 grinder for, um, about $150. And what what is burr, what is burr set? Um, so there are kind of, there are a bunch of different ways of grinding coffee. Um, most people are probably familiar with like the Braun helicopter grinders that have a blade in them that, you know, kind of whip around and, and beat your beans up. Um, the, they, they, they like flay the beans. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it, it's more pulverizing than grinding. Um, and you know, the big issue with those is that they create a very inconsistent, um, grind size, which means that your extraction is kind of all over the place because extraction is related to surface area. And so you get some tiny particles that extract quickly and make the coffee really bitter. And then some big particles that extract slowly and make it really sour. So it's very hard to get a good cup. A burr is actually a set of meshed um, plates that have a specific uh, ridge pattern in them that uh, it it actually looks like kind of a a gear set um, that sort of grinds the beans progressively and allows you to get a very consistent grind pattern, um, which is, which leads to a much tastier extraction because you don't have all of the variability. So, so burr sets usually are composed of a, a top and a bottom burr and the beans kind of slide in between them. And, and there's a, a kind of an angle at which the burrs interact and slowly grind the beans down. Um, and so a nice burr set makes a huge difference in, um, in the quality of grind and, and thus the resulting taste of the coffee. Okay. That's really good. Um, just uh, uh, quickly, Neil, what, what home grinder, like electric grinder, do you have or would you recommend? I, I, I mean, kind of like the, the low-end standard one to me would be like the Rocky Ranchilio. Yeah, um, that's a great one. Um, I uh, so I actually like the Barazza Virtuoso. Um, that's a, a nice, pretty flexible grinder. Um, uh, I I have a ridiculous one at home. I, I have this crazy thing called a Versalab M3, uh, which <laughs> is the uh, which is a single shot grinder, primarily targeted for espresso and. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's amazing. It produces incredible coffee, but I have to say that the, the Millwright comes pretty close. Um, uh, and it's, you know, a 10th of the price. Basically. That's so cool. I, I'm really, so, and, and the Millwright, it just does one grind size. No, that's actually the other thing. It's got a really nice adjustment mechanism oh. and, and you can do, so I've done espresso with it and gotten, incredibly delicious, consistent shots. I've done pour overs with it and I've even done French press, which requires a really coarse grind. Mm -hmm. And that's not quite as convenient because you need to run quite a bit of coffee through. I had to actually do two and a half loads of coffee to get a proper French press. So, um, but, but for pour over AeroPress, espresso, any of those methods, it's just phenomenal. Um, okay. And it does do a good job of French press. It's just a lot more work. Cool. This is going on my uh, Christmas <laughs> wish list. <laughs> I like it. Send this to Carla. Right. Um, so tell us about your second uh, tool choice, Neil. Yeah. So, so first of all, it was incredibly hard to come up with only four. So uh, yes, I, I know it was torturing you. <laughs> I know um, there are so many others, uh, but I, I was trying to pick ones um, that hadn't been mentioned by other people on your show um, and uh, were maybe a little off the beaten path. So, uh, so the second one um, is related to three D printing. So, um, so. 
about seven years ago, I started a company called Perfect Coffee. And um, one of the things that we did was produce a lot of uh, equipment for doing custom analysis and packaging of high-end coffee. And, you know, we looked at the market and had to uh, and realized pretty quickly that we had to produce our own gear because there wasn't anything commercially available that met our needs. So we started prototyping and building uh, lots of interesting things for measuring grind size, um, for uh, basically doing very precise weighing of uh, ground coffee. And, you know, of course, uh, 3D printing was really coming into its own at that point. And, um, the thing that I found was, you know, desktop printers were great for doing prototyping work and, and for doing checks, um, print checks and things like that. But you really needed a lot of the more exotic um, uh, processes like SLS and and the machines were just prohibitively expensive for um, for the volume of stuff that we needed to build. And a friend of mine told me about Fictive, which is an amazing service where you basically just upload your 3d models and, and they organize, a uh, basically, a, a, a set of affiliates who can print them for you using, um, the latest and high end equipment. And, and the two things that really blew me away about the service were, uh, first of all, they'd built software that checked your models to make sure they were printable. And, you know, especially back in 2013 and 2014, it was pretty easy to produce a model that would just result in, in a flawed or unusable print. And, you know, they solved 90, 95% of those problems with their, with their front end and, and their engineers who check your models. But the other thing was the turnaround time was phenomenal. Um, in a lot of cases, I've been able to get parts same day. Um, and certainly within one to two days and also being able to send a whole suite of parts out for printing and, and have fictive, del um, deliver them to a bunch of different printers and bring them all back for you, um, meant that we could get a lot more done a lot faster. Um, so the access to high-end printing technology, the fact that they did a great job uh, making sure your models would work, and the fact that you could get stuff back so quickly um, and pretty cost-effectively was was just a game changer for us. So uh, um, there's places like Shapeways, which has been around for almost as long, um, and others. How, how, how does Fictive compare to these other options that kind of do the same thing of outsourcing um, a 3D printing? Yeah, I you know I've used um, Shapeways uh, and they have a good service too. Um, I've looked at a bunch of others um, like Plethora, um, and Plethora is a little more focused on CNC, or at least it was the last time I checked. But I I think the the level of service the and the turnaround time and this integrated um, model checking that the fictive um, kind of really led with just made them so reliable and so quick that they kind of floated to the top. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of these things, once you have a really good experience with a company and, and they um, deliver on their promise, you tend to, tend to stick to them. And, and have you tried using them for, um, other kinds of exotic materials uh, like injection molding or your thing? I, I haven't, I haven't used any of their um, other services yet. Um, I really started using them um, for the 3d printing stuff. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, I just haven't had a, a CNC problem. Um, that would probably be the next place I'd go with them. I, I think, you know, the injection molting services and um, some of their other processes look interesting, but they tend to have longer lead times. And, and I think the thing that really made Fictive stand out for me was just how quickly I could turn stuff around, especially in the Bay Area. Um, so, and, and how about their prices? How Where would you say their prices rank? Uh, very competitive. Um, they were, uh, for some things, a little bit, um, lower price than the others that I evaluated at the time. Um, but 
you know, in one sense, the, you know, the pricing is fantastic just because you don't have to uh, buy the machine or, um, and, and it seems that they also have sort of negotiated a, a pretty standard rate card. Um, so, so things, uh, you don't have to think about pricing on kind of a per, um, printer, uh, basis with them. So the standardization was nice too. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's not dirt cheap. Um, it's, but it's definitely competitive. And, um, you know, when we looked at this in the context of overall, um, prototyping budgets, it, it easily fit in. Okay. And so th this is something that you would only use for like one or two parts. You wouldn't be using this for like short run production. We have, we've used it for both. So, um, so a couple of interesting cases. Uh, so when I was at Blue Bottle, uh, we designed and built the Blue Bottle Dripper and um, we actually did about 75 prototypes um, of that. Um, through Fictive. So those were all one-offs of various design iterations. Um, but we also had a bunch of equipment we were using on another project. And uh, we basically did um, short run and replacement parts with them. So, you know, we'd order, you know, two or three parts that would wear out on about a one to two week basis and, and just keep them coming that way. Cause it was, it was much more convenient and much more cost effective than, than even doing, you know, more traditional short run manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Fictive F I C T I V. Right. Yeah. And, and I've used them recently for some personal projects and, um, it's, it, it, it's a really nice service. I'm, I'm a fan. Okay. Well, thanks. Great, Great tip. All right. Tell us about good notes. Yeah. So, you know, when I was thinking through the things to talk about on the show, um, you know, one of the, one of the dimensions I was considering w was what tools have completely changed the way I work on, uh, on a daily basis. And, you know, I love writing on paper. Um, I, I went through a big fountain pen and mechanical pencil phase, um, and, you know, still love the, you know, the very tactile feel of, of writing with nice instruments on nice paper. But, you know, the problem is you end up with a desk full of chicken scratchings and half done drawings and things like that. And you can never find them, especially when you're moving around a lot. And so the, you know, the appeal of being able to do everything digitally and, and have it kind of all in one place where it's easily accessible um, has always been really, really strong, but, you know, for a long time, the technology just didn't work well. So, you know, I, I remember in 1993, when I was at Apple getting one of the prototype Newtons and, and being super excited about having a tablet I could write on because that much more closely fit the way I, I work and then just being sort of despondent about, um, you know, the limitations of that technology. It was, a, <laughs> it was a really cool concept and very well executed. It's just, it needed about another 20 years of progress before it was going to be something I could live with every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, when the early iPads came out, um, that was pretty awesome. The, um, you know, the form factor was great, but, using those crazy pencils with the, you know, kind of floppy rubber tips on them and trying to draw on, uh, on them just never was very satisfying. But, you know, even beyond just kind of the tactile experience, um, you know, a lot of the software, um, you know, either felt really under featured or really over featured. And it felt like you were always fighting with the with the application, trying to get it to just behave like a simple sheet of paper. And so when the iPad pros came out with the pencil, um, you know, they kind of solved the hardware problem. Um, but, uh, as I was looking through all the options for, you know, actually maintaining a notebook and having kind of different paper layouts and stuff, um, and having tried tons of different applications, good notes really floated to the top. And, um, you know, I've been using it, pretty consistently for about two and a half, three years now. And I can honestly say I've mostly abandoned paper um, as, as kind of the way of sort of sketching and outlining. 
and, and all of that. It just, the thing about it that's nice is the, you know, the hardware and tactile interaction is pretty good, but the software just completely disappears. You select a pen or an eraser and, and it just, it, it so closely mimics what you do um, in the analog world. It's just great. A number of people have recommended something, and I, it might maybe even Ari did this, something called Paper-like, which is this kind of transparent sheet that you put on top of the iPad display that gives it a bit of tooth, kind of like a like drawing paper, so that the pencil, there's a bit of friction. Yeah. Um, do you use that, or are you happy with just going across the glass? So it's funny you mentioned that, because I uh, I just ordered a paper-like um, uh, screen about a week ago, and it's I think it's sitting in my mailbox at home, and I'm excited okay. to try it. But um, I actually did try some of the earlier screen protectors, and um, I found, for me, the, um, the glass isn't too distracting um, just because of the way I write, um, uh, which is actually a mess on paper. I, I tend to rest my hand on the, on the surface. Um, I get enough control that it, it hasn't been a big detractor for me and it hasn't slowed me down much, but I, I'm excited to try the, the paper like shield and see if this one with its little micro bumps actually improves things. So mm -hmm. going back to good notes, does is my understanding that it actually does OCR or some way it can actually recognizes your handwriting? No, so I I actually don't use the OCR um, functionality. Um, you know, they may have added it, but I actually really just like um, handwriting, my handwriting's terrible, but I can read it. <laughs> um, and, and it allows me to sort of organize things. So I, I do a lot of sort of spatial, um, relations when I'm even doing, uh, just written documents, you know, making tables and, and associations and things like that. Um, so, um, so I, I've generally found OCR kind of gets in the way of that. Um, the because other I thought, thing, so I thought the whole, the whole point of the, the app was that it, you could search for anything you wrote handwritten, you could search for all your handwritten notes. And, the, um, so I'm just wondering how that, does that work well? Um, so the way my brain works, um, I tend to remember things, um, just having written them down sort of makes them sink in better. Um, and then I can find things very quickly in notebook style, um, notebook style settings essentially. So I have about 25 notebooks and good notes organized by topic. And so it's, it's easy for me to find stuff. Um, I actually, so I played around with Evernote, which does have pretty good um, searchability of handwritten stuff. And and it's an interesting feature, but it, it wasn't really that important to me. Um, for me, it's just the, the ability to organize and um, lay things out the same way I would on paper. Um, and then to be able to interact with even a large body of notes um, in the same way I would a stack of paper or a, a set of notebooks um, really kind of does the job for me. What is the advantage over a paper notebook? Um, two clear advantages for me. First of all, um, everything stays in one place and can easily be moved back and forth between devices. So I can just shoot something that I've sketched out on good notes over to my Mac and send it as a PDF or something like that. Um, uh, also basically having uh, the ability to go back and, and easily add on to documents, you know, create more space for them and, and sort of continue to expand them over time is, is really useful. And, and again, just having them all in one place where I can, uh, where I can easily get access to them. Like I, I tend to work in a couple of different locations and uh, I never have the, the disappointing moment where I realize I left the sketch I really need on my desk at home when I'm in the office. So, you know, all the, all the digital portability, mutability and transferability is, is really, um, really nice in this environment. And do you use the colors a lot? I, I do. Uh, uh, generally, uh, 
do most things in one color. And then, um, you know, when adding concepts or layers, uh, we'll start adding in other colors. Um, and, you know, I think that's actually one of the, one of the weaknesses, they don't have the, the best color palette management, but you know, it's good enough. It's like, I, I view it as like the little pack of pens I used to carry with me. Uh, you know, I had a red one, a green one, a blue one, a yellow one, and a black one. And, and the, that was kind of my palette. Um, so. And and obviously you can do free style drawings and brushes. To what level does it allow you to do more technical um, sketching where you might have dimensions or arrows or you want everything to be square or or is it not really the thing for that it's it's not the thing for that um when i kind of get to that point um it's either um omnigraphal or illustrator um uh or um uh, fusion 360 or something like that um yeah where goodness sort of fits into my workflow is you know, for sort of initial concept and ideation, it's just a really flexible, easy place to to kind of noodle on things and get ready for kind of the next iteration where you start going into more um, more formal and structured tools because those those take their own work. <laughs> sure. Okay, and this runs on uh, iPad and what else? Uh, it's, it's iOS. Um, okay. so, um, I, I've used it pretty exclusively on, uh, the iPad pro, but, um, I do have it installed on my iPhone so I can look at notes and sketches. Okay. One, one other quick thing I, I find when you try to, um, uh, take notes during a meeting, doing it on a keyboard is very distracting. Um, and the, the machine actually creates a barrier between you and the other people you're talking with. And so this is another interesting aspect of this is it, it kind of removes those barriers and allows you to pay more attention to the conversation as well. Because it's quieter than like clicking on the keys. It's quieter than clicking at the, on the keys. Um, the, just how it's positioned on the mm -hmm. desk and the fact you don't have to look at it while you're writing allows sure. you to maintain much better engagement with people. And it just, it fades into the background in a way I've never been able to get a, a laptop to do. Yeah, that makes good sense. Okay. So uh, you have one more. Uh, tell us about your, your final tool. Yeah. So um, huge fan of uh, music and all things audio. And, um, you know, one of the joys of music for me is being able to hear all of the nuances and performance and recording and engineering. And, um, you know, that, that set me down the, the path of, um, you, you know, finding great stereo equipment and, you know, getting better and better recordings, um, you know, through my teens and twenties, uh, I was, I was kind of on the hunt for great audio experiences. Um, and about uh, six or seven years ago, um, a friend of mine recommended uh, the JH Audio um, in-ear monitors to me um, as being, you know, an incredibly accurate um, way of reproducing music. And, you know, so I bought them uh, thinking it'd be an interesting experience. And the thing that's interesting about uh, these in-ear monitors are... Uh, you actually have to go to an audiologist and have them take a mold of your ear canal. So you go to a, a, a doctor effectively and they squirt silicon in your ear uh, to get a, a perfect mold of your ear canal. And then you send this off to uh, JH Audio and they CNC a specific um, earbud for you that really tightly fits into your ear canal. Um, and the the drivers are incredibly accurate and it and the effect is it produces this incredibly realistic accurate high fidelity um, audio image and also blocks out all of the surrounding noise so it's this very immersive um, experience um, so i got them initially you know for listening to music and um uh, monitoring recording and stuff like that, but then um, realized they had a, a little 
mic attachment so you can use them as um you know just like your um uh ear pods or or you know your standard you know phone earphones um and the difference in sound quality and the isolation just made them my all-time favorite audio purchase um and so i've had these and i use them every day it's one of those there are two or three things that i reach for every single day and these are pretty much the top of that list so you put them in like are you using them right this minute i am um, using them right this minute okay <laughs> um yeah so they work as noise canceling and as hi-fi absolutely yeah so it's it, it's it's not noise canceling in that they don't actually go in and and try to um uh algorithmically remove um environmental sound it's really isolation it's like having uh you know a pair of shooting earmuffs on or um uh, uh, or, you know, the, the foam things you put in your ear at concerts or whatever, it, it just, it blocks out all of the, um, all of the external noise and then just sort of beams the, the really high quality audio directly into your ear. Um, so I guess one of my complaints with, uh, with noise canceling has been that it, it kind of changes the character of the sound in the process of removing the background noise and, and this this doesn't do that at all. So it gives you a much nicer signal. That's cool. You know, I've, I've uh, read and seen tutorials of people who use that Sugru moldable silicone to uh -huh. make their own, um, like, you know, poor person's version of uh, customized earbuds. And uh, people say that it works pretty well. I hear it does. Um, and, you know, it's very much the same concept. Um, uh, JH audio has just sort of, sort of perfected the process and, and made it kind of a commercial, uh, a commercial thing. So, uh, there's very little DIY. Um, but yeah, there, I think anything that, that really isolates your, uh, eardrums from the environment and allows the sound to get projected properly will will be a big step up like all of the I, I guess my big complaint with a lot of the earbuds is they don't fit quite right and mm -hmm. they often have um sort of not great drivers in them um so you, you just don't get the the fidelity and quality out of them sure so um neil tell us about uh r0 systems uh and how it got started and and what uh the uh, company does. Yeah. This, is where, this is where you're currently working, is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm currently chief technology officer at R0 Systems. So, you know, this, this company was really um, uh, in a product of the pandemic. Um, a bunch of us uh, in March and April were, um, you know, coming to grips with the reality uh, we're all experiencing now and, you know, started wondering how we could help make spaces safer for people once we started uh, kind of returning to our normal routines. And, you know, uh, a thing that really caught our eye was the idea of using um, ultraviolet light to uh, remove pathogens from surfaces and, um, and also from the air. And so uh, as we did more research, we saw there was, you know, really a century of great um, science on, on how this works and how effective it was. And, you know, this has been used extensively in hospitals, um, especially over the last, uh, 10 or 15 years, but the systems are, uh, really designed for medical environments. They're very expensive and require a lot of specialized knowledge. So, so we set out to make something that worked as well as the stuff that's used in operating rooms, but was much more affordable and, and usable. Um, so the first product we've built is, a uh, uh, about a 72 inch tall, powerful UV lamp that, uh, can, uh, decontaminate at about a thousand square feet in seven minutes. And, um, we also recognized that a big challenge for people was, uh, using the tool consistently and being able to go back and audit what had been done. So we also 
integrated a whole um, uh, process management and IoT aspect into this. So, um, you know, for instance, as a school district, you can go back and say, yes, we actually did disinfect all of the classrooms last night so they're safe for the kids to come into. So, so, so um, go, going back to the, um, what do you call the, the unit that's that we're talking about? Does it have a name? Yeah, the, the first product is called ARC. Um, ARC. Uh, so, the, so the ARC, in the seven minutes, I uh, presume that, that nobody's inside the room while it's doing it for that seven minutes? Exactly. So, okay. so you take the, the ARC and put it in the center of the room, press a button, it does a countdown, you leave the room and uh, come back uh, seven minutes later and, and the room's completely and uh, disinfected. Since it's working with ultraviolet light, does it does does the disinfection in penetrate places where the light does not go? Um, generally, it is line of sight. Um, so if you're in shadow uh, in the shadow of the light, you're you're not going to get the same level of disinfection. There's a certain amount of reflected light that that will help. But what we found was that most surfaces um, that people touch regularly, um, where there's significant risk of transmission, uh, you can hit with one or two uh, treatments in, in your average room. So, so we're pretty effective at, at getting um, the high touch surfaces in a, in a single pass. Um, the other big thing, though, is that uh, it also kills any uh, aerosolized pathogens. Um, and that it does very effectively through uh, through line of sight and just the, the natural circulation that happens in the room, and uh, and that actually helps limit the kind of the settling and surface contamination. Later and on. does um, w w what does actually say the the intensity lumens of the light compared to sunlight? That's a great question that I should know off the top of my head, but don't. Uh, we're significantly more powerful than than sunlight and we also um so sunlight is uh uva and uvb for the most part um because the um the atmosphere absorbs a lot of the uvc that's produced by the sun so we're in a uh kind of a, a higher frequency range that's actually more um uh more fatal to pathogens and we produce a tremendous amount of output it's about a 1200 watt lamp and i just don't recall off the top of my head how that translates okay. to lumens so it's something you, you can't be anywhere near it when this thing's on yeah you you definitely don't want to be in the room when it's on and one of the things we spent a lot of engineering time on was uh the fail safes to um, prevent people from getting accidental exposure so we've got a, a whole system that uh that uh, detects any kind of motion and immediately shuts things down Cool. That sounds great. So it's uh, R zero systems, and uh, it's not really meant for for homes, right? It's hotel rooms, hospitals. Yeah. So we've we've been working with um, lots of schools um, and uh, businesses that are trying to to make their environment safe for um, kids and employees to return. So so mostly schools and and uh, and businesses. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Well, Neil, this has been really great hearing from you, all the cool stuff that you are working on and your interests. Uh, I'm really excited about that coffee grinder. Definitely something that's going on my list. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Yeah, it was a real delight. And so we're so glad that you joined us. My pleasure. Well, this was really fun. Thank you for the opportunity. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools, that's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers, Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. 
Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Brian Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it.